Today we have a distinguished guest, uh, Daniel Kral from Masaryk University in Brno. Uh, so Dan is quite a figure in our uh, combinatorial and uh, TCS community. Uh, well, first of all, he has a number of great results and, um, and uh, it's a really extremely active, I would say, over the last decade. Uh, from what I know, he spent uh, quite uh, some time recently on um, graph limits, uh, also known as graphons. But at least I know Dan better from the uh, graph coloring side. Uh, so, uh, for example, three or four years ago, you disproved with your co-authors the Steinberg conjecture, which uh, which was quite known, I think, in our community. So that was that every planar graph that has no cycles of length four and five is free colorable that was the conjecture and it's it's not true uh, there's a nice construction uh, today as we see we will hear something about quasi random uh, structures in, in combinatorics i don't know much about it i'm looking forward uh, to see the talk so welcome all welcome dan and please start Okay, thank you for such an introduction. Now I actually feel even more nervous than before. And I should perhaps disclose that I was like always a person who likes giving talks in person. And I must say that this is actually the first seminar talk that I'm giving remotely. So, so I'm even more nervous, like the introduction definitely didn't help me too much. And uh, so I'm Hopefully it will go well. I opened the chat on the side. So if you have any questions during the talk, like please pose them in the chat. Uh, likewise, I think the group is quite small. I was I was looking and there like about 15 people connected. So I guess you may also just unmute yourself and ask the question. And uh, I will be talking today about uh, quasi-randomness. Uh, there will be also a little bit about graph limits, but uh, we will see, okay, anyway. So let me start with general motivation. So basically the motivation is to kind of get a sense what it means that uh, something looks like a random object. So being it a graph, being it a permutation, you may be thinking about partial orders, hypergraphs, directed graphs, and so on. And we will actually see four different kinds of these objects during this talk. And uh, of course, like uh, we never really can have a random object because I mean, if we, if I pick a random graph on 10 vertices, if a non-trivial probability, I may get a clique, whatever notion of a random graph I, I start with, I may get an empty graph, but this is not a kind of graph we would generally expect to get. We would perhaps expect to get a somewhat graph, which would be like, uh, maybe like the density will be half and maybe we would have some other properties. And we would like to understand what properties such a randomly chosen, randomly generated graph would have. And why do we care? So I mostly care because I, I find the mathematics around this subject quite nice, but uh, the applications in computer science, both uh, I think it's important to understand like uh, uh, in, in relation, like quasi-randomness in relation to the randomization or application in cryptography. So actually like lots of uh, these tests can be, or the tests which are related to, to the notion of quasi-randomness can be used to, to look at uh, encrypted text and if there are some dependencies. And that actually is another area of, of applications that in statistics one may notice some dependencies between data which otherwise might go unspotted. So I will not be talking about these, these applications during this talk and I will focus only on the mathematics. I must also say that I'm not like super familiar with these applications, I'm aware of their existence, but uh, I, I never really try to pursue like the, the results to, to be brought to, to more applied. And uh, maybe it's also partly my fault in the sense that I know some problems that uh, people a little bit on the more applied side would be actually interested in, but they might not be so mathematically charmful as uh, the topics I have been looking at so far. So the four objects that I've been look I, I intend to be looking in the next uh, uh, 50 to 60 minutes are graphs, tournaments, permutations, and Latin squares. I will spend more, most of the time on graphs, even if uh, perhaps myself, I cannot add so much to the topic, but I will mention some connections to graph limits. And in general, also this analytic view on quasi-randomness will reappear in other parts of the talk, for example, at permutations. 
So let me start with graphs. And uh, now I should say what kind of model of a, of a random graph we're thinking of. And for me, like I want to start with the classical edge any random graph model. So I have, uh, I have n vertices and I'm putting uh, an edge between any two of them with probability p independently of, of uh, one of the others. So, so for me, a truly random graph would be a graph that would come from this edge any process. So I start with n vertices for every pair independently of the others. I decide if I want to include an edge or not. I'll do so with probability p. And the object that I'm getting is a graph. Please notice that I'm thinking of labeled graphs. So the, the several the graphs which are isomorphic to each other can actually be generated in several different ways. And now if somebody comes to me with a specific graph, I kind of want to, to say whether it looks like that it could have been generated with high probability through this process. Like, of course, if you come to me with a single specific graph and the probability is quite small, it can be computed. So, so, so one perhaps should not be looking only at a single graph, but maybe rather at a, at a sequence gra of graphs of increasing orders. So whenever I will be actually talking about quasi-randomness, I will not be talking, even if I will be quite often imprecisely saying it, but I will not have it in mind that I'm talking about a single object, but I'm rather thinking about a sequence object of objects of increasing orders. And I'm trying to understand if the objects in this sequence look like that they could have been generated through this, uh, in this particular case, at dash any random process. And actually the theory of, uh, of quasi-random graphs, uh, that goes quite back in the history. So it can be traced to the 80s. And most of the results that I'm going to present on this and the next slide are actually from the, from the early and late 80s. And uh, it started with, uh, with results of Redl, Thomason, Chung, Graham, and Wilson. And now let me try to actually maybe make the little bit more sense of what for me it would mean that a sequence of graphs is quasi-random. So I said I wish to that sequence to look like uh, graphs that could be generated per, through this r dash any random process. And there are many properties that these graphs may have. And uh, throughout this talk, I will be usually looking at the, at the density of substructures. So, so for that, I have here a definition. And I want to say that the density of a graph H in a graph G is the probability that a random mapping of the vertices of H to the vertices of G actually yields a homomorphism. So, so let's say that H is an H. So when the density of an H would be just the H density of the graph. If I'm looking, let's say at C4, which will be a graph which will be prominently appearing in the, in, uh, in the relation to, to graph quasi-randomness, then uh, what, I, what I'm looking is that I map the vertices of C4 to my large graph randomly, and I'm looking at the probability that what I'm going to see, with the, the mapping that I'm going to obtain will be a homomorphism from C4. So if I map the four vertices, I've been looking at the probability that the first vertex is connected to the second, second to the third, third to the fourth, and uh, fourth to the fifth. And one result that actually, if you haven't seen it before, and I, I personally found it very surprising when I, when I saw it uh, for the first time, is that if we, we define that a sequence of graphs is quasi-random, if the density of every graph in the sequence converges to its expected density in the r dash random graph. So for example, let's say we fix P. So when the density of K2, we would require in the sequence to converge to P. The density of a triangle, we would require to converge to P cube. The density of C4, not surprisingly, to P to the fourth. The density of Kn, we would require to converge to P to, to n choose two. Density of uh, larger cycles, a cycle of length L to P to L. And a result which uh, was proven by Redl and then like uh, somehow appeared, uh, appeared, uh, appear, uh, reappeared in, in a broader context in the work of Thomas and Chung, Graham and Wilson is that actually instead of requiring that the densities of all graphs do converge to their expected density in the r dash random graph, it's enough to require the density of an edge and the density of C4. So for me, it's 
it's kind of a surprising result because if I have a, any sequence of graphs and I know that in that sequence, the edge density converges to P and the homomorphic density of C4 converges to P to, to the four, then I know that the density of any graph in that sequence converges to its expected density in the address range random graph. So from this point of view, so instead of, of saying that a graph is quasi-random, and now we have a definition here which, which uh, deals with countably many conditions, when we actually can have two conditions, the density of edges and the density of C4. And actually it turns out that uh, this notion of graph quasi-randomness is quite robust. So it's equivalent to many other different notions as was pr proven by Chung, Graham and Wilson. And I mentioned a couple of them here. So I tried to prepare some illustrative figures. I don't know how illustrative they are or they are not, but let me, let me try to do, do my best job using them. So, so, one, the, so let's say the definition is that we want the density of all substructures. And again, we're talking about the sequence. So in the sequence to converge to, to where expected density in the truly random graph. And the first, first equivalent definition that I have already mentioned is that in case of looking at all possible graphs, we may just look at an edge and the cycle of length four. And so this is a definition of quasi-randomness which goes through the substructure density. But we may also, so it's kind of a local definition because I, if I'm looking at the density of C4, I'm just looking at four vertices. If I'm looking at the density of uh, K5, I'm looking at five vertices, but we may also define quasi-randomness. And actually it will be an equivalent definition from a more global point of view. So one of equivalent definitions is that I will be looking at linear size subsets of vertices. So let's say I fix some epsilon and I will be looking at, at subsets of, of uh, at least epsilon times and vertices. And uh, uh, maybe now let's say capital N will be the number of vertices in my graph. So epsilon times capital N vertices. And let's say this set will have size N and I want that set to have the right density or at least not to deviate from it too much. So essentially I will be requiring that if I'm looking at a linear size subset of vertices, its density is around P. And it turns out, so this is definitely something I would expect to happen in the, in the, in the edge or any random graph, because I don't expect that I would have a part of that graph which would be significantly sparser or significantly denser. And actually this is again equivalent to the first two, two properties. Another property is related to cuts. So, so here I was looking how many edges are inside a set. And the another equivalent property is that I may be looking at two disjoint sets of vertices. Let's say they're not too small. Again, I am thinking of linear size subsets of vertices. And I want the number of edges between them to be roughly P times the, the product of the sizes of these two sets. So I should have been written roughly because maybe there should be some plus little or one. And again, this property turns out to be equivalent to the previous three. So if I have a sequence of graphs that satisfies the first property, it's the second, if and only if it satisfies the third, if and only if it satisfies the fourth. And I have prepared here one more, and I should mention there were several others, but I kind of found these like of somewhat different natures. And the last property is actually related to the spectra of the adjacency matrices. So if I get an edge range random graph, which is large, what I would see is that the largest eigenvalue will be P times the number of vertices. So let me normalize it to P and all the other eigenvalues will be sublinear. So I just put here zero. If let's say I normalize, I divide by N eigen zero. And again, this spectral property is equivalent to all the four previous properties. So what we have seen here is that actually the definition of quasi-randomness, which, which will be also applied to, to other structures, through the, the substructure density, meaning that I require that the density of every possible substructure in the host graph is as, as in the truly random graph. And this is equivalent to many other properties. And from my point of view, this actually makes the notion of uh, graph quasi-randomness very robust. And uh, now I would like to make the connection to, to graph limits that Piotr mentioned that I have been working a lot. So, so we're can, talking here. Can I interrupt? Uh, mm -hmm. sure. I kind of forgot, or I don't know, uh, what is the relation between the spectrum and the vector of eigenvalues uh, of, a, of a matrix matrices? So, so the spectrum of the adjacency matrix is the, 
is the multiset of the eigenvalues. I'm ah, not... the multisystem. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and I normalize here by n. So, I mean, if I wanted to be like really, like properly talking about it, I should be saying that the largest eigenvalue is p plus little o of one, and when the other ones are sorry, plus, p times n plus little o of n, and the other ones are little o of n. So oh, that's that's I... clear. That's clear. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, so since we're talking about uh, we're talking about sequences of graphs, it might be, and I mean, I don't want to go too much to the graph limits, but I actually want to to make the connection because I will be using uh, the analytic view also in the in the part of the talk of the permutations. So I want to make a connection to to graph limits, but I, I don't want to be explaining graph limits like in uh, some uh, super detailed sense. So. So the aim of graph limits is to associate some analytic object with a sequence of graphs which is said to be convergent. And convergent means that the density of every subgraph in the sequence converges. So what I, what I mean by that is that I have a sequence of graphs where the density of edges converges, the density of C force converges, the density of K freeze converges, the density of K4 converges, and so on. So note that this definition is weaker than the definition of quasi-randomness because in the quasi-randomness I was requiring that the density converges and the limit is the one that is uh, the, the expected density. Here I just require a convergence. So for example, if I take a sequence of cliques, it's a convergent sequence of, uh, of graphs. And with such a sequence, I want to associate an analytic object that would be capturing the properties of that sequence. So, so formally that object would be a symmetric measurable function from unit square to zero one. And usually what I will be doing is that I will be drawing a square. The black areas will be ones, the white areas will be zeros. It's an interval, so it can also be gray. So there can be some value between zero and, and, and one. And in the first approximation, one can think of this as a continuous version of the adjacency matrix. But I must say that if, even if this sounds very intuitive and maybe like kind of kindergarten, like it's it's very very imprecise because actually to build a theory one like needs like some some tools. So perhaps the most simple tools is using regularity decomposition of graphs and then apply some result from probability. Where some uh, some other approaches uh, using, for example, ultra limits. But definitely like even if this idea that it's a continuous version of adjacent symmetrics sounds very plausible when it's, it's a huge oversimplification. Nevertheless, equipped with this definition, we may be guessing that a sequence of graphs will be quasi-random if and only if its limit will be, will be one half. So it will be a, a graphon, which is equal to one half almost everywhere. And that's actually the case. And uh, this brings us to a slightly stronger concept. So maybe before I introduce it, I should have and apologies. Like it's, as I said, like it's the first time I'm actually giving this talk and, and giving it in particular uh, remotely. So, so I should have, before going to this, I should have maybe went through the examples I have prepared here. So, so I have prepared here, like as an example of a convergent sequence of graphs, a sequence of complete bipartite graphs where the two parts are in the ratio one to two. I sketch here the, the corresponding adjacency matrix and the corresponding limit. So for me, the origin will be always in the top left corner. So we see here two white squares corresponding to the independent sets of the graph and two black rectangles corresponding to all the edges between. So not surprisingly, this graph one would represent a sequence of graphs that looks like complete bipartite graphs with parts of equal sizes. This graph one would correspond to a sequence of graphs where I have a click on half of the vertices, click on quarter of the vertices, one a ver vertices, and so on. And this graph one, which is equal to, let's say, one half everywhere, so this would actually correspond to the to the to the sequence of graphs which is quasi random because we just don't expect to see any structure. We just expect to see the density of edges one half everywhere. So it is possible to define some sampling process. I don't want to go through it. So it makes sense to define density of graphs in graphons. And one can show that the, the if 
I am promised that the edge density of a graph one is P. So we would perhaps guess that the edge density would just mean that I integrate the, the function over the unit square and that's indeed what the edge density is. And the uh, density of C4, which would have a slightly more complex definition is P to the four, when the graph one is equal to P almost everywhere. And I will be dropping this almost everywhere if, if when I'm talking about graph one. And this actually leads to a more general concept in, in, uh, in, uh, in graph theory and graph limits, because what we have seen here is that we have two specific graphs, K2 and C4. And if we know where density is, we know what the graph one is. So we may be thinking, are there any other like uh, pairs, triples, quadruples of graphs, such that if we fix their density, we will have uniquely determined the structure of the graph one. And for example, another graph one that has this property is this one, because this is the only graph one with edge density one half and triangle density being zero. So we know that from, from Turan's theorem, sorry, Mantel's theorem, but the, the largest possible edge density of a triangle free graph is one half and it's achieved by uh, complete bipartite graphs. So basically this is another example of a graph form where if I fix two specific subgraphs in this particular case, it will be the edge density to be one half and the triangle density to be zero. When again, I know the structure. So this leads to a more general concept, which is called finitely forcible. And uh, so, so I already said the definition, so let me just repeat it. So, so I say that a graph one is finitely forcible if there exist finitely many graphs and their densities, such that whenever I have another graph one where the density of GI is DI. So let me again emphasize that this, this exists means there are finitely many such graphs and densities, then that graph one must be the graph one W zero. So I already mentioned this graph one is finitely forcible, edge density zero, uh, sorry, edge density one half, triangle density zero. This graph one is finitely forcible. So that's, uh, that's because of quasi randomness. I fix edge density one half, uh, density of C4 to be one over 16. Lovas and Chosh actually showed that all graph ones that looks like these checker graph ones, which are called step graph ones, are finitely forcible. And Lovas and Segedi actually gave some additional examples of finitely forcible graph ones. So I prepared here two examples that actually come from their paper from 2011. And uh, there was some hope, like if one looks at these examples, like even on like, one would appreciate that they look like simple. So that one they can have some structure, clearly as step graph ones, for example, but they, their structure does not seem to be like particularly complex. So, so there have been a couple of problems related to that. So, so one was like, is it true that every finitely forcible graph one has a simple structure? And then, as I already, for example, mentioned here, this graph appears as an extreme example for Mantel's theorem. So another problem that was in this area is if every extreme graph theory problem has a finitely forcible optimum. So perhaps the hope would be that first we can show that these finitely forcible graph ones have simple structure. And we may also show that if we're looking at some wide range of problems from extreme graph theory, they will be, we will be guaranteed that the ex, at least one of the extremes will be one of these finitely forcible graph ones or graphs that do correspond to it. And then maybe give, we can exploit the simplicity of them. So the big news is that neither is true. So for the simple structure, actually Lovas and, and Segedi offered various conjectures. So we're talking about the space of typical vertices and we were saying that it has some nice properties like being uh, finite dimensional, being compact. And uh, in, in work with uh, my postdocs and students, we, we basically destroyed all these conjectures. So we came up with various examples that uh, the space is not only compact, it's not locally compact, not only is not finite dimensional, you can find like uh, uh, infinite dimensional hypercubes in it, but uh, or like homeomorphic when I'm looking at this topological, topological space, where, where this uh, finite dimension would Im imply like small regularity partitions. So we have an example of, of graphons that uh, are finitely forcible and don't have small epsilon regular partitions. And uh, 
when it actually turned out that the truth is much worse. And uh, with uh, Jay Cooper, who at that time was my actually an undergrad student at Warwick, and Tysa Martins, she was my PhD student, we actually showed that uh, every graphon is a subgraphon of a finitely forcible graphon. So whatever structure you may think, like however complex uh, graph or graph limit you may think of, you may embed it into a finitely forcible one. And then with, uh, with uh, Latsilovas, and I put here junior to emphasize it's not the Lovas that I was speaking on the previous son, but, uh, slides, but his son, John Noel, who was my postdoc, and Kuba Sosnovets, who was my MSc student, we actually showed that not only we can find these as subgraphons, but we can make the, almost the whole graphon to be it. So basically, for every epsilon, up we can, if, that uh, there will be only epsilon vertices of the graphon, which we, if we remove, the rest will be the graphon we're trying to embed. So it's like very strong universality property. And for the conjecture that I mentioned earlier, this, uh, this one, which uh, by many was thought like to be like uh, one of two most important conjectures in graph limit, we actually constructed a counter example with Andrzej Grzeszek and again with, uh, with uh, Vlace. And I, I see I'm missing here a comma, which I do apologize for. And we showed that there are extremal problems that do not have finitely forcible optimum. So basically there's uh, this hope that uh, every problem even if we already know that the finitely possible graph limits do not have a simple structure, but at least like every extremal problem would have a solution which is finitely forcible. And this is also, this, this hope is also not existing. Just to give you some idea or appreciation how the situation may look like, I prepare here some, some finite examples of finitely forcible graphons. So this is the very first one we constructed with uh, with uh, Roman and Jan, which uh, has the space, uh, the, the space of typical vertices non-compact, and that non-compactness is actually caused by this bit. So if one would look here carefully, one can see some kind of like uh, uh, getting smaller, smaller, or kind of like uh, one can say VC dimension if one wishes, like somehow getting quite complex structure here. And when these are like other examples, so this one is actually how the, the one we constructed with Jake and, and Taiza, that uh, basically we have here some auxiliary structure and in this style that if you have very good eyes, you can see W, then that's actually where we can embed an arbitrary graph on. So basically we kind of set up some auxiliary structure and then use it to force one tile to look like, uh, like what we wish it to look. So I wanted to make this detour, first of all, because I find this concept of uh, finitely forcible uh, graphons like to be to be natural in the sense that we generalize it quasi random graphs. But I also wanted to mention a joint work with Andre, who's who's from Krakow, and and wanted to please him as as my my co-author. So, so maybe this might be a good time for questions, since I do intend to leave graphs now and start talking about quasi randomness of of other 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 combinatorial structures. So maybe I pause here and wait if. Uh, uh, any questions? But well, does not seem to be the case. So, so the rest of the talk will be more quasi-random. So I will be talking about. Uh, I will not be making these detours to 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 graph limits or permutation limits so much, and. Uh, and also, like I, when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking if I should include some proofs. But when I rather decided that I will be talking about connected results and and not be be doing like, uh, I mean, there will be one sketch of proof, but I will be doing close to no proofs during this talk. So I want to briefly mention tournaments, uh, which uh, just when we on the same page, a tournament is just an orientation of a complete graph. So we may see here like uh, uh, four specific tournaments. These tournaments are transitive, meaning that one can number the vertices in this particular case, one, two, three, four, five, but one has always an edge from a vertex with a smaller number to a larger number. This is a transitive tournament on six vertices. This is a transitive tournament on seven vertices. And this is a tournament on five vertices, which I will explain in a second why I, I put it here. 
And one may be, it's perhaps like it's not hard to imagine what it would mean when a sequence of tournaments is quasi random. A sequence of tournaments is quasi random if uh, the density of every sub tournament in the sequence converges to its expected density in, uh, in a truly random tournament. A truly random tournament is a tournament where I orient every edge randomly. And uh, it's, it's well known that uh, transitive tournaments do force quasi randomness. So if I, uh, if I promise you that the density of transit, and I should have said his transitive tournaments with at least four vertices. So if I promise you that uh, the density of a transitive tournament, let's say on five vertices like this one, is what one would expect it to be in a truly random tournament, which uh, would be five factorial divided by two to 10, then uh, I, I know that the tournament is, is quasi random. So if I have a sequence of graphs where the density of this particle transitive tournament converges to its expected density, then I know that the density of all tournaments converges to, to my expected density. And uh, this, uh, as I said, this was, uh, this was well known as a, a simple, uh, simple flag algebra proof due to Corigliano and Rasborov. And when there was a, there was a thought that maybe there might be some others, and there's indeed an, another five vertex tournament with the same property. So unlike in the, in the graphs where we needed two graphs, and it actually can be shown that one graph is not enough, here we can fix the density of a single tournament. And when we have this sporadic five vertex tournament, that if I have a sequence of tournaments, and uh, in this sequence, the density of every sub tournament, uh, uh, sorry, uh, density of these tournaments converges to its expected density in a, in a random tournament when the density of every sub tournament converges to its expected density. And when, okay, so we found an example on five vertices and we in this part, we means like humankind in this particular case, correctly, Anno, Paranta and Sato. And one would wonder, are there some others? So in particular, if you look at this one, I personally cannot see too much structure in it. So there are somehow these two cyclic triangles and when you have edges from these two vertices to these two vertices, but it doesn't seem to have some great properties to generalize. And it's actually not so hard to show that there is no seven vertex tournament, which appears in the paper of which is long Shapira and Sudakov. They actually were looking at, uh, at also like uh, some locality properties in tournament. So this is one of many results in their paper. So, and uh, equipped with this one would wonder, okay, so maybe there still might be some additional five or six vertex ones. And actually with uh, Robert Hancock, who was my postdoc, Adam Cabela, who was also my postdoc, Tarza Martins, who actually at that time was not already my PhD student, she, has, she had graduated, uh, Parente, Fiona Skerman and Honza Wolet, we, we actually showed that uh, that there are no additional tournaments. So basically in addition to transitive tournaments, this is the only one that actually forces quasi-randomness. So I personally don't have any intuition why this tournament is, is, uh, is exceptional. I may briefly say that what we basically did is we took a tournamenton, like the, the analytic representation of, uh, of, uh, of tournaments, the truly quasi-random one, and we, we did some local modification, preserving the density of, uh, of the tournaments. We have been looking in a way that, uh, that the density is preserved, but the tournament on is not uh, corresponding to a quasi-random sequence anymore. So I perhaps don't want to talk too much about tournament on. I want to spend most of my talk about talking about permutations. I actually think that uh, there are a couple of nice open problems left, which I would like to mention. But uh, I think it's again might be a good time for me to pause and uh, see if there are any questions. So when you say that the tra uh, tra uh, a tournament is quasi random for a single, like a transitive tournament, I should think that if I take any transitive tournament, like on 100 vertices, and I just have there uh, the, the probability for this 100 vertex tournament, right, which is uh, which is 100 factorial over over 2 to the 100, right? No, 100 factor over 2 to 100, choose 2. Choose 2, sorry, yes. If I just have it this one, right, then uh, then everything is uh, exactly. forced, oh, I see. Exactly. And is, it, is there an easy way to see that, uh, that you know, that uh, 
that a single edge is not forcing in a tournament or a triangle is not forcing? Uh, for triangle, like basically triangle forces just the degrees, if I do remember correctly. So, so if you, if you, so, so I mean, I might not be saying something which is not true, but I do believe I do remember correctly. I mean, I haven't been working on this for, for a couple of years. Uh, so, uh, so if you fix the density of a transitive free vertex tournament, when you guarantee that every vertex will have roughly in degree half and uh, out degree half of all the vertices, but nothing more. Okay. So it's a step to that, but it's not sufficient. But once you fix a four vertex transitive tournament, when you have the structure completely fixed. And when I fix a probability of an edge, then what do I have? Uh, yeah. It's a tournament, so there's uh, all edges. Oh, sh oh, sorry, yes, yes, of course, okay. But if you start thinking about uh, directed graphs, and I was thinking, so, so but definitely if you fix the density of all four vertex uh, uh, subgraphs in a directed graph, you will again get the quasi-randomness, but I'm not actually sure what is the smallest set known. And then you would, of course, need to, to fix the edge density value. And then does it make sense uh, to fix uh, more than one graph and fi find if the set forces No, it everything? actually makes sense. So if I, if uh, like you, so so for tournaments, like, I, I mean, I don't think there have been a study of like fixing more than one tournament. For graphs, like I actually noticed that the Misha Tiomkin was talking about his joint work with Asaf Shapira yesterday in Prague. And, uh, and they showed that, uh, that if you, fix the density of all creeks in, the, in a graph, it doesn't force quasi-randomness. So people are definitely interested in forcing, like looking what our finite or infinite tuples of graphs you may fix and they will give you the quasi-randomness. But I must say that I didn't prepare a slide with all the results and I perhaps won't be able to, to list too many from my head right now. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Are any further questions? So, so I'm going to move to permutations. And uh, again, like for me, the quasi-randomness of permutation will be that I want to be looking at the density of substructures. And now I need to define what is a sub-permutation for me. So first I should say that I will be looking at permutations purely from the combinatorial point of view. So I won't be looking at any like algebraic properties uh, like uh, cycles or signs or anything like that. For me, a permutation will be just numbers from one to n ordered. So essentially I'm kind of looking on two linear orders on the same set of elements. One is giving me the order from left to right. The other one is giving me their actual values. So basically if I take one order, I would, it would sort me then from left to right. And the other order would tell me this is the smallest, this is the second smallest, this is the third smallest distance of four smallest and so on. And for me, a sub-permutation, so I prepared here two examples because I believe like if you see, 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 the, uh, see an example, like you immediately understand. So let's say I want to look at the sub-permutation induced by the three underlying elements. So it will have three elements. The smallest of them becomes one. So because this three is smallest among three, five, five, three, six, the middle element is one, five becomes two because it's the second smallest and six becomes three. And likewise here, if I'm looking at the sub-permutation given by this five, three, one, but when sub-permutation is three, two, one. So essentially I keep both linear orders as, as they are. And I should say here that even if I will be using sub-permutations to kind of make a link to, to substructures, when uh, in the permutation community, this, this is actually called patterns. So, so I should like uh, mention that, but I, I somehow prepare, prefer using uh, sub-permutations in this context. And again, we have a limit object. It was uh, developed in, a, in, a, in two papers by, uh, by Hopen, Kohayakawa, Moreira, Rath, and Sampaio. And uh, the limit object in this particular case, of course, one can may, may think of it as a function, which actually is fought in, in their papers, but I personally find it more natural to think of it as a probability measure on a zero one squared with unit marginals. So unit marginal for me means if I project a measure on uh, the X coordinate, I get a uniform measure. And if I project it on the Y coordinate, I again get a uniform measure. 
And when I prepared here like uh, four possible measures, so, so this line means that the support of the measure is on, the, on this main diagonal. And not surprisingly, one would think of this as a permutation, which is one, two, three, four, five, six up to n. So an increasing permutation. So if I, if I would take a kind of a checker box and I would be checking where the elements of the permutation are, if I have a, a, and the identity permutation, and basically like in the limit, I would be kind of getting a measure that would look like this. So this is the decreasing. This is the one where I have two increasing segments and where values are, are in, interlaced. And for the truly random permutation, I will just have the uniform measure because I just expect that the, the values are distributed everywhere. So if I take one, let's say I take one of the, n, uh, the uh, an n permutation randomly, then I don't expect that in the first half I will have smaller values or larger values. So I just expect to get the uniform measure on the, on the unit square. So I don't want to talk too, too much about this. I will be using these pictures, but I, I hope that somehow on the intuitive level, one can understand that uh, these, uh, these pictures somehow represent how, how the permutation looks like, increasing, decreasing, to increasing interlaced segments. And I will actually need this picture to actually sketch something which is not a proof, but it's almost a proof. So for permutations, it's uh, at least in combinatorics, it uh, was not known if the same phenomenon as for graphs holds. So, so let me maybe, even if perhaps by now you would guess what I would mean by, by quasi-random sequence. So I will say that a sequence of permutation is quasi-random if uh, the density of every sub-permutation converges to its expected density. So if I have a K permutation, the expected density is one over K factorial. And in this, uh, in this analytic sense, this would mean that the sequence of permutation converges to the uniform measure. And Graham asked is actually where exists K zero, such that if I'm guaranteed that the density of all K zero permutations converges to what it should, then uh, it converges for all permutations. So let's say I would know that the density of every five permutation converges to one over five factorial. Then I would like, when the question is, does it imply when the same holds for 10 permutations, 12 permutations, and so on. And it's not hard to observe that, uh, that K0 equal three is not sufficient. And I prefer, prepare here a sketch of the, of the proof. So let's look at the permutation, large permutation that has this shape. So I basically, let's say on even positions, I put even numbers increasing. On odd positions, I put odd numbers decreasing. And in this permutation, it's uh, not hard to, to compute. The density of one, two, three will be quarter. So it's like an exercise, but it's not hard to, or at least the limit, if any sufficiently large will be quarter. And when one takes a permutation that looks like this, so the first half on the, let's say even positions, I'm decreasing from roughly n over two to zero. And when on, uh, in the second half on even positions, I'm decreasing from n to roughly n over two. And then on the odd positions, in the first half, I'm increasing from n half to n, and then on the second half from one to roughly n over two. And again, it's not hard to compute when in this picture, the density of one to three is actually one over eight. So in the truly random, we would expect one to three to have density one over six, which is between quarter and one eighth. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to transform this permuton, this permutation limit in a continuous way to this permutation limit. So here I kind of think of this as uh, very thin rectangles, which I start opening. So I, we can see the continuous process here. And eventually these rectangles becomes almost square until they become the same square. This is a continuous process. So somewhere in the middle, the density of one, two, three becomes one over six because it changes continuously from quarter to one eighth. So somewhere in the middle of this process, it must be one over six. However, we have here lots of symmetries. So if the density of one, two, three is one over six, when the density of three to one is one over six, because the picture is symmetric. And therefore the sum of the densities of the remaining four, which are also symmetric, 
is two first, and therefore each of them is also one over six. So somehow when we hit the density one, two, three, because the picture is horizontally and vertically symmetric, we immediately have that the densities of all of them are actually one over six. And that shows that clearly like you would agree with me that if I give you a permutation that looks somehow like this, but even if in it like every free permutation has density one over six, like this is clearly not a, anything that looks random. So it won't be. So this shows that for this question of Graham, K0 being free is not sufficient. So I don't know if I did a good job of explaining this, but this was perhaps the only sketch of proof that I have actually prepared for today. Okay, I will be annoying. I, I have I have a question. So uh, is it, should I be convinced that if you have a, a continuous process from the left to right, then uh, actually the this density it goes monot uh, monotonically down from one fourth to one no, eight. No, 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 you shouldn't be convinced it goes monotonically. You should be convinced it goes continuously. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good point. Thanks. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I don't know. In fact, I don't know whether it goes monotonically. Mm -hmm. Thanks thanks for the question. I think it was important. Okay, so we know the answer is not free. And actually with uh, Oleg Pigurko, we, we showed that the answer is four. So you can, so if you have a sequence of permutations and the, every four point permutation converges to what it should, then the sequence is, uh, is quasi random. And uh, you may notice that there is some kind of years here and some difference. So actually Graham asked this question, I believe in the nineties, and, uh, but it actually turned out as we later learned from, from a paper which actually uses this result in some statistical testing, that uh, this result existed in these views in statistics. So Hefding, which is the Hefding from the Hefding's inequality, Hefding Azuma inequality, if you prefer, actually showed that uh, the answer to Graham questions is true for K0, K0 equal to five. And Yana Gimoto actually more or less established a statement which is equivalent to this one. So somehow in a different area of mathematics, in a very different context and statistics, the same results were already existing while the combinatorics were was uh, not quite aware of them. And of course, now the question is like, if we do need like uh, all 24 of these permutations, right? So, so this, uh, so we answered the question. The question was asking, does there exist an order which is sufficient? The, the answer is yes, four, four is clearly optimal. We cannot do three. If I know densities of five patterns or five sub-permutations, I know densities of four. So any number larger than four also works, but do I really need all 24 of them? And now, of course, like you will immediately realize that 23 would do the job because if you know 23, then you can compute the remaining ones. But uh, can we go lower? And actually, there are a couple of results. So first of all, I like the negative result. So the negative result is that we need at least four permutations. And this has been proven by my bachelor student, uh, Martin Kurečka. And actually, he, he proved this result without the assumption of the order of these permutations. So basically, whatever set of uh, two or three permutations you give me, there exists a sequence of permutations that these uh, two or three permutations that you have given me converges to what they should, but the sequence is still not quasi random. So this is a negative result. So clearly we need at least four. And as I mentioned, it holds even if I'm not restricting to taking permutations of all the four. And, but on the positive side, we actually know that uh, there are eight tuples of permutations that do the job. And we actually do the job in a stronger sense. So, so that's a joint result with uh, Tim Cham, who was uh, my PhD student, John Noel, who was my postdoc, Yanni Pehova, she was my PhD student, Mariam Sharizadeh, she, she was my colleague at Warwick, and Honza Volets, at that time he, he was not already my PhD student, but he used to be my PhD student at some point in the history. And uh, so what we did is we looked at the sets or sets of permutations such that I will not know anything about any individual density of any of them. I will just know the sum of their densities. And surprisingly, 
there are three eight tuples and I draw them here like in this, uh, rather than writing numbers, I thought it will be easier to do the dots and I assume like uh, you understand that this is one, two, three, four, this is one, two, four, three and so on. So there are three eight tuples such that if I tell you that the sum of the densities of these eight permutations converges to one third, where eight over 24, then the sequence is actually quasi-random. Likewise, the sum of, of these, if it converges to one third, the sum of these, if it converges to one third, the sum of these, if this converges to one half. So this should be a union of two of them. And I believe like this one and this one. And of course, like if, if you go to the complement, that also lies. And these are the only subsets of uh, four permutations with this property. So, so what we know is like, of course, if I, if you promise me more, you promise me that the density of each of them is one, one over 24, when you're also promising me the sum. So clearly each of these sets works also in the sense that you fix their densities and when you have quasi-randomness, but it works also in the stronger sense that it's enough to know that the sum of their densities is uh, what it should be. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and it remains an open problem. And I think it's actually a good open problem to, to decide if uh, there exists a, a, a set of four, five, six, or seven permutations such that instead of the sum, one would be fixing the density of each of them to be one over 24, whether this would force a quasi random mass. So this, uh, this I would like to highlight particle as an open problem here. And uh, I think if the answer is four, it would very nicely, uh, nicely complement uh, Martin's result. So I should maybe pause here. I believe I still have maybe five to 10 minutes remaining. And I will very briefly mention our very recent results on, on Latin squares. But before I do so, I think this might be again a good time for, for questions. So it does not seem to be the case. So in that case, I am coming to the last part of the talk. And uh, I want to be talking about Latin squares. So, and I, I haven't prepared too much. I mean, I can, I just want to state the result and explain what kind of quasi randomness we're looking at. So just a quick, uh, a quick, uh, uh, quick kind of, uh, let be on the same, uh, same wave. So a Latin square is, uh, is a matrix or a square if you prefer, uh, if uh, it's, uh, it has as many columns as as many rows. So let's say in this particular example, it's a, it's a Latin square of order five. And in each row and in each column, there's a permutation of numbers from one to n. So, so in each row, well, I can find each of the numbers from one to n exactly once. And uh, Frederick Garbe and uh, Robert Hancock, before we were my postdocs in Brno, Honza Hlapky and Mariam Sharizadeh, they actually studied uh, sequences of Latin squares. They defined a convergence for them. And uh, so basically they, they, they initiated this, uh, this analytic view on large Latin squares. And one of the problems they couldn't resolve was if there exists some K and L such that if the sequence of Latin squares is quasi-random and I would need to and explain in a second what kind of substructures we're looking at, then uh, it's equivalent to the density. And now I use the word pattern here because I kind of find it better because it's definitely not a Latin subsquare what I'm going to do. So I, I use the word pattern is what one would expect in a truly randomly chosen Latin square. So, so what I mean by that, so, so, I, so let's say I have this Latin square and I will be lo looking at the, so I choose some columns here. I have chosen the second and the third column and I choose some rows. Here I have chosen the, the second row and the fourth row. I look at the elements. So these are the four red elements. And again, and, and similarly to permutation, I just reorder them according to their orders. So one is the smallest, so it stays one. Three is the second smallest, so it's become two. Four is the first smallest, so it's become three. And five is the, is the, is the largest, so it's four. You may, of course, ask what would happen if I see the same element twice. But I would tell you that if the Latin square is uh, is large, when this happens with probability zero, if K and L, K and L are fixed. 
so I just may ignore it. And uh, what we did uh, in the fall with uh, Jay Cooper, who is now my PhD student, Anderla Maison and Samuel Moore, who are my postdocs, we actually show that the answer here is, uh, that the answer is yes, such K and L exist. And, uh, and, uh, and we showed that uh, it's enough to choose K to be two and L to be three. So if one has a large Latin square and one looks at all the two times three patterns and they have density one over 720, then the density of every K times L pattern will be one over K times L factorial. And this result is optimal. So we, we so, so one can think like would a smaller pattern do the job? So one can do two things to get a smaller pattern, change this three to two and it wouldn't. Or one can also think like, okay, maybe change this two to one and maybe I will allow you to increase the other coordinate and that would also not work. And we have examples of, of sequences of Latin squares where let's say all the two times two patterns converge to one over 24 where density is, but the sequence itself is not quasi random. So I don't want to maybe be talking too much about, about this proof here, but I just wanted to again highlight and I find it somewhat uh, surprising that in all these uh, combinatorial structures that uh, we, we kind of see a very similar phenomena. We have like uh, quasi randomness defined through, uh, through substructure density, meaning uh, here I'm looking at the density of patterns and there's always exist finitely many substructures. In the case of graphs, it was an H and C4. In the case of tournaments, transitive tournaments, in the case of permutations, four permutations, in the case of Latin squares, two times three patterns. And these finitely many substructures actually completely capture the densities of all the others. And uh, I personally think that there could be some kind of a general theorem with one has a relational structure with some properties when this phenomena will always exist, but I, I don't know how exactly how to, how to approach such a, uh, such a general statement. So with uh, this remark, I maybe just conclude and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks.